Hello, everyone. My name is American Joe Matuszewski, and I am the Senior Government Affairs Director here at Old Line Government Affairs. For this edit edition of Online with Old Line, we're delighted to introduce Senator Melanie Griffith, representing District 25 in Prince George's County. And I might add, she is the president pro tem of the Senate. So everybody behave themselves out there. Don't get out of line. Uh, we're going to get started, first of all, by uh, let me welcome you, Senator. So, uh, thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. I know that even when the session's not in, there are many, many requests. And particularly during these trying times, um, your, your uh, phone is probably ringing off the uh, out of your pocketbook. No, I was going to say off the hook, but probably out of the pocketbook. But uh, first, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your district? Because we're, we're doing these across the state. We'd like to give our viewers and listeners an idea of a, a little bit about your background and the geography of your district and the makeup of it. I'd be happy to, and it's great to see you as always. I think you're one of the people that I've known the longest in my journey to the Maryland State Senate. So it's always a pleasure to be with you. you so I have uh, the pleasure of representing the 25th Legislative District in Prince George's County, which is central and southern Prince George's County. I um, actually came to the Washington metropolitan area back in the 80s to attend graduate school at Howard University and uh, am a social worker by training and have done a lot of work in um, healthcare and public health and am now living what I call my best life. I still dabble a little bit in healthcare, but I'm working for the Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council. I am an active supporter of the arts and so I get the opportunity to pair up my social work and healthcare background with an arts and social practices uh, program. So that's that's a little bit about what I do when I'm not in Annapolis. My district is a, a pretty diverse district. It includes some challenged communities that are um, struggling with, you know, employment issues and, um, you know, communities that have experienced a, a crime as some communities have across the state and country. And then I have some more affluent communities where there's robust employment and activities. My district includes Joint Base Andrews and Pr Prince George's Community College. Those are a couple of the assets in the 25th district. But what I'll tell you, American Joe, is that all of my constituents, no matter where they live in the 25th district in Prince George's County across the state, they all basically want the same things, which is a safe place to live and raise their children and an opportunity to be gainfully employed or to have a successful business and the ability to have recreation and experience entertainment and for me, the arts. So um, I just continue to work with my colleagues across the county and across the state to try to bring that quality of life to all of the residents of our communities. Well, thank you for that profile. And it certainly doesn't hurt. I will note that you are a member of the Budget and Taxation Committee. That is one of the most powerful committees in the legislature. They handle all the money that comes through the legislature. So that is that is real, that's power. That really is power. But you also are a member of the Executive Nominations Committee. And that's real power because you have a vote to put people in their um, respective offices and uh, some of the, most of the uh, of appointments that the governor makes, you know, comes before you for your, uh, for your consideration. So that's a, a heady job and a lot of responsibility. And uh, I hear that you're doing a great, great job as, as a member of that committee. What I wanted to ask you before we get into anything uh, uh, about issues is that you've served in both the House and the Senate. And I just, just real quick, can you just give us some sort of a, 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 a 30,000 foot view of the difference between the two? If, now that's a great question. And, and uh, I get asked it a lot. And a lot of people are surprised to learn that the vast majority of members of the Senate of Maryland have served in the House of Delegates. And so I, like many of my colleagues started in the House of Delegates. I spent a little more time there than most. I spent 16 years in the House and I'm now uh, entering my third year in, this, in the Senate. 
And the biggest difference I would just say is for me, it has been an extreme increased workload. I think that um, most of the boards and commissions and joint committees in the state have representation from each chamber. And so the House has 141 members to choose from when they're building up the representation of the state on boards and commissions, work groups and task forces. The 47 senators are covering the same number of work groups and joint committees as the 141 House members. So there is a, a difference in terms of workload. In addition, I'll say in the House, um, we had a great relationship with the community, civic leaders and, and constituents. But still today, I find that constituents tend to call the Senate office more when they have need for service or are looking to connect with a government, government agency or department. So House members work very hard. I know I was one of them, but the expectations of the senators are a little different, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I do know that. Yeah. You, you, you have a, a, a very, very good and long career in the legislature. Are there any mentors that helped you along the way that gave you some guidance and important information that were of benefit? Absolutely. Even before I was successful, because I, like some of my colleagues, had a couple of unsuccessful bids, both for the House and the Senate. But very early on, I worked with and for then Congressman Albert Wynn. And he had served in the General Assembly and was just a tremendous guide and teacher to tell me how to avoid some pitfalls mm -hmm. when I won elected office. When I got to the General Assembly, I served on the House Judiciary Committee, and so I had the pleasure of working with then Chairman Joe Valerio, who's still a dear friend. And also, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the chair of the Appropriations Committee that I served on for 13 years. Howard Pete Rollins was a tremendous mentor, um, poured into a group of us freshman delegates and just helped us navigate the landmines and learn the state's budget, uh, both operating and capital. And then uh, there were a few women legislators like former Senator uh, Dr. Beatrice Tignor, who then went on to serve on the school board in Prince George's County and Senator Gloria Lala. And I could go on and on, but the one that would probably surprise you is President Bill Ferguson who is young enough to be my son, but who I learn from every day. He is a tremendous leader that just has wonderful communication skills. He's probably one of the smartest people that I've interacted with. And so just by his moving through the chamber, I learned something from him almost every day I'm in his company. And uh, would uh, also mention Chair Guy Gazone, who I served with in the House and now in the Senate. So I've Everywhere I go, I just find people who are doing well at what they do, and they're doing good, and they're doing well, and I try to emulate their successes. Well, President Ferguson has a great backup in you as President Pro Tem of the Senate, I will, I will say that. While we're uh, uh, on the Senate part of your career, since you've been in the Senate, or maybe even going back to the House as well, too, what, what has been your what you consider your biggest accomplishment? in your legislative career? Yeah, I'm gonna cheat and do two because we don't follow instructions all the time. <laughs> um, I have to say that after serving one year in the Senate to have 47 colleagues, well, 46 and me, I voted for me too, but to have male, female, rural, urban, Republican and Democrat to receive unanimous support in my bid to become president pro tem was just a just a tremendous experience for me. And I, I cherish the trust that my colleagues have you know, given me. And I, I study and work hard to earn that trust every day. Mm -hmm. um, one of the moments that I was most proud of is being the floor leader this session on Senate Bill 1, which was the bill that settled the 15 year lawsuit with the uh, historically black colleges and universities and the, co the coalition that represented them mm -hmm. in that case, it was valuable to me because we actually got a unanimous vote out of the Senate. 
And that meant that we made our case. We were able to take an issue that had been long fought and hard fought and bring it to closure after years of following in the footsteps of people who worked very hard to get it done. This Senate got it done. And I'm just very proud that we were able to get a consensus piece of legislation and um, be able to lead that discussion through the floor was an honor for me. Well, you, you are in a in a, uh, a changing environment in the Senate, if you will, with the transition from uh, Senator Miller to Senator Ferguson. And there seems to be, as there always is with, with change, a new dynamism there that uh, a high, heightened level of activity. So uh, it's, it's heartening to know that he stays in touch with number two as often as, 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 quick, as much as he does. That, that's very, very good to know. What I was uh, really interested in was um, what policy initiatives do you hope to accomplish in the future? Those are really great questions. One of the things that we, we did this past session that I'm confident we will build on moving forward is just the deep dive that we did in terms of understanding the needs of our business community, particularly as we start to transition to the other side of this pandemic. Um, learning about the broadband needs across the state and connectivity and how that impacted businesses who were transitioning from all public facing sort of storefront kind of service to having to adjust their, their business model to deal with the new economy. Um, trying to um, be a part of policy making that makes it easier for businesses to conduct their work in the state of Maryland to continue to employ our residents and to continue to make and the make the revenue that supports them is going to be a big priority. Um, one of the things that I've learned in my years on the budget committee is there's a finite amount of money. And so we can only ask our, our taxpayers and our homeowners to contribute so much. And we look for our business community through uh, the employment of our citizens and through their ability to generate revenue, that's what keeps the engine churning. And mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll be focusing on policies that make it easier for businesses to do business in Maryland and make it easy for them to employ our residents, making sure that we have the kind of workforce in place. And so what we did with education policy to try to make sure that we have students graduating in the careers that our employers need, those are gonna be big priorities and that we take advantage of um, opportunities to build and grow around our underutilized metro stations. Transportation continues to be an issue, whether you talk about uh, public you know, transportation or our roadways, just kind of trying to balance those conversations with policy and budget is going to be something I'll look to to participate in as well. I understand. Uh, let me ask you a little bit about the functioning of the legislature between last year and this year with the uh, arrangements that were made and the redesigning to, to deal with COVID. Um, I, I thought that the session went quite well this year, regardless of the Zooming and not being, in, being there in person. Um, but I would like your impression of how it affected your job, uh, you know, reaching out to your constituents or them reaching out to you, and, and if you thought it, it if you thought it accomplished its mission. Look, I'm tremendously proud of what we were able to accomplish, particularly because of the physical limitations that this session presented. I think the presiding officers in both chambers did a tremendous job putting in place a plan that allowed us to continue to do the people's business, but do it safely. Um, I will acknowledge that this was probably, I call it one of the most intense and impactful sessions of my career. And a part of the intensity came from the fact that I don't think any of us realized how much of our conversations with constituents, uh, stakeholders, opinion leaders, lobbyists, and agency uh, staff happen in what I call curbside conversations. You're walking to a meeting or from session and you see someone that you need to get input from on an important issue or a piece of legislation you're working on. And we just didn't have the benefit of that. 
Mm -hmm. I found is my cell phone was a lot busier. I was getting texts morning, noon, night, weekends, holidays. It didn't matter. People got access to us. And I, I think that's probably a good thing because it's the people's input that helps make good policy, great policy. But it was also intense because you never felt like you had, it never got turned off. Mm -hmm. Where even though we were not physically accessible, I felt like I was more accessible to many of the constituencies. And um, it was it was tough on our staff as well. Yep. So, um, but we got a lot done under unusual circumstances. And I think people who live further away from Annapolis or people for whom childcare or transportation might be an issue, or maybe you're running your business and can't afford to take a half day to come to Annapolis. I think participating in these uh, virtual hearings made it easier for a different audience to participate. Yeah, yeah. Before we wrap it up, I'd like to get your impression uh, and share with our audience uh, the functions and, and your participation on the Executive Nominations Committee. That's, that's a unique committee and not a lot of people know a lot about it. It is a unique committee and it's one of those committees that while you're in the House of Delegates, you know very little about. And so I was fortunate to have been appointed to executive noms in my first year on, on the Senate side. Um, basically, it is a process that I hadn't been exposed to but quickly learned involved getting to know people, getting to know there are so many boards, commissions, agencies and entities that work together to make this state the great state it is. And so it really does require probably of all my committee work and I chair the health and human service subcommittee. So that requires a lot of research and homework, but executive noms really requires a lot of reading and resume reviews and meeting with individuals who are interested in or who have been nominated for appointments to positions. Um, it is a, a highly valued role and I believe that every member of that committee takes their charge very seriously. Mm -hmm. We do our homework, we read the resumes, we study the positions that people are, are being nominated for, and we cross check to make sure that their resumes and their interviews actually fit for the positions that, that they're being interviewed for. And so it is a complicated and time consuming piece of work but it's what is required in order to do the state's business effectively. And I, I enjoy it. Sure, sure. Well, I have to tell you, if um, my lobbying partner, Brett Leininger, is a hockey player, was a hockey player, I should say, and you, uh, you got elected to the Senate, you got uh, named to the, uh, to the speaker pro tem position, and you're on the executive nom. So when you score three goals in a game, it's called a hat trick. You have hit the hat trick, I have to tell you. So uh, I'm very, very impressed with what you've done and certainly your accessibility because we we have worked on, uh, we actually started a conversation over the summer this past mm -hmm. year and worked on, on a bill that uh, sailed through the legislature. I congratulate you on that. So before we bring this to an end, can you share with our viewers and listeners one unique thing or fun fact about yourself that you would like to share with them? I think most people would be surprised to learn that for about seven years, I owned a karaoke business called Metal G Karaoke. I grew up in a family where we didn't have a lot of money, but we had music and we had each other. And you know, during my first year in the General Assembly, I got to go on a American a Council of Young Political Leaders trip to Japan, and I was introduced to karaoke, and I fell in love, and so it's been a big part of my life. It's what I do. I can sing when no one's watching, and even when people are, and have a great time, so that's my fun fact. Oh, that is fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. Senator Griffith, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. We look forward to having more opportunities to work with you and talk to you. Thanks for sharing with our audience, and Good luck to you uh, in your future endeavors, and I look forward to working with you again. Thank you so much for having me and allowing me to talk about my love working with these incredible members of the Senate of Maryland and President Bill Ferguson and all of you. Thank, Thank you for having me. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.